Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us today. Uh, I am here to welcome you. Um, my name is Trudy Brands, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of Dean Perberini, Maria Perberini, who is sponsoring the lecture series at here at the School of Architecture and Design. The lecture series for the 2023-2024 uh, series addresses uh, current and future challenges in design and practice and research, uh, questioning existing models, imagining desired models of creation, and highlighting the social responsibility of the designer and the future. So I think our guest is appropriate for our discussion today, and I would like to now welcome Evan Chiet, who is going to introduce our desk, uh, our guest, and enjoy the lecture series. Thank you, uh, thank you everybody, for joining. It's, it's really my pleasure to uh, see you guys here and also to welcome uh, and host uh, my good friend and colleague, Yun Fu, um, uh, who I've known for quite a while uh, since we overlapped at um, GSD. Uh, so Yoon is a partner of uh, Semester Studio and also a design critic at Harvard GSD, where he teaches in the architecture uh, and in the urban design core studios, as well as in a variety of research topics, including housing, cities, and, and theory. Uh, his work really focuses on a lot of the confluence of those topics um, and really is about kind of the uh, design thinking in a sense, or the methods of, kind of solutions that survey different approaches to uh, familiar classes of problem. So I think that really applies in, in, I think hopefully to a lot of your classwork and a lot of the things that we teach in this school as, as well. Um, he is also the author of a variety of books, books um, including um, Thinking and Building on Shaky Ground, which is what he will be present on today, um, which was just recently re released by Brookhauser uh, last year, uh, Southeast Asian Modern from Roots to Contemporary Turns and Korean Modern, The Matter of Identity. Um, he is also a graduate of uh, himself uh, in a doctoral and master's at um, Harvard University and has, of course, held a variety of traveling fellowships uh, and a, a, a variety of fellowship positions at universities all, all around the world. Um, so with that, I would uh, welcome our esteemed colleague here, and we really look forward to your talk. Thank you, Yen. So the arrows are light. Sorry, Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. I really enjoy a, a, a very intimate audience here. And um, I mean, I really want to thank the school for the opportunity to be here, and especially my uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Evan. And uh, I mean, he is very modest. He was really the star kind of a, a graduate of our program and uh, you know, took out every single award that was possible to be taken out. Uh, probably almost made a, a profit, uh, even when balanced against uh, our uh, tuition. Um, and so, um, and to, you know, I, in, in academia and kind of our field, um, it's very interesting, but it's also very demanding. So every time you see someone who has found a kind of um, uh, an academic home that's able to kind of host their curiosities um, and that they're healthy and kind of uh, excited, it's always so energetic to see. It kind of keeps our I'll dream alive, and I hope I can also find a home like this, uh, as he did uh, very soon. Um, and I'm very, I'm particularly kind of excited about this kind of forum for kind of unfolding the book a little bit, because usually I think the book is written. So if you want the official version of it, you, um, uh, I believe you can convince your library to acquire one. Uh, and if I can convince your library to acquire two copies, that would be uh, fantastic. Uh, if I would convince your library to acquire three copies, then that starts to be quite strange. I think, you know, you should talk to your library about whether the resources are being spent in the most efficient way. But I, I would like this to be a slightly more um, uh, uh, kind of um, informally flowing to uh, show you, um, or at least to reveal to you some of the uh, challenges and some of the alternatives that uh, really comes with trying to pull together a, a book or a long form kind of publication like this. So I think there are um, two particular parts that I have prepared. Um, the first is more specifically about um, my research work. And so my research, because it's the type of topics that I'm interested in, usually I have found it uh, uh, um, uh, to uh, fit a, a book length better. It kind of allows me enough length 
um, uh, to uh, unfold the ideas in a way that I feel is useful. Uh, they usually deal with kind of cultural issues, um, different interpretations of cities and architecture. Um, so I would be, uh, of course, delighted to share some of that. And the second part um, is uh, time dependent, depends on how free flowing I am and uh, whether I take up all my time before I get there. But it's really about some of the um, work that uh, I and my collaborators have been thinking about since. And I have included in here uh, in this talk because um, there is this kind of saying which I came across as I was doing my doctoral work, which is that you know one kind of comes across when when one kind of publishes uh, your first book that's kind of so authored, it's kind of by accident, right? You know, you, it's a combination of your own interests, but you don't quite know where it's going. Um, it could be a combination of your doctoral advisor's interest. And so, you know, in the end, you produce something you think is kind of uh, valuable or interesting. Um, if somebody is willing to publish it, that's even better. And then it's a book. But I think in a way, it's really the second uh, book, or at least what you do after this first uh, initial step at uh, an inquiry that begins to establish a certain direction in your work. And uh, if it's possible, I would really love to kind of uh, brainstorm that with the group here to see whether that direction has any uh, particular legs. So I have, in the past kind of few years, um, that's to say uh, through my doctoral work that began kind of in the uh, later 2010s um, until 2020, um, I have found it useful to structure it on a yearly cadence because you know, we live in years, but the cadence basically oscillates between uh, studies of very specific places. So uh, I've had the opportunity to work on two particular books on um, what we felt were understudied uh, geographies in the world. So one was Korea, which I think very often kind of uh, lived in the shadow of um, uh, its, its larger neighbors, right? Japan, uh, China, or even in combination the other kind of East Asian tigers. Um, and so we uh, kind of um, studied or we thought about how uh, modernity or the influences of modern architecture and urbanism really unfolded in that particular place, right? In a path dependent way, as opposed to converging towards the singular vision of uh, what the modern city should look like. Um, we did a similar kind of investigation, um, but of course, following local clues about Southeast Asia, really spanning from Taiwan all the way down through uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, um, and down to New Zealand. So dealing with this other uh, what we felt was characteristically an island geography. And uh, I mean, well, some of the conclusions was that the way kind of um, uh, architectural design urban influences, especially the modern ones, the way they kind of uh, arrive and unfold in a island geography is very different from a continental one. It's usually much more dispersed, um, uh, accidental sometimes, and, um, uh, and the way they play out is also much more uh, isolated and kind of, they take on their own meaning very quickly. Um, but the other side of my work, which is the main kind of a book I would like to share uh, with you today, um, are these uh, broader horizontal surveys of particular classes of design problems. And so I have always, I think, been very interested in uh, different ways of solving the same problem. And this is an interest, I mean, now I have the benefit of hindsight. But say, you know, in primary school, in mathematics class, you know, you, the teacher sets you a certain problem, you solve it a certain way, you might have gotten the right answer, but then the teacher tells you, you know, that's not the way to solve it, and you have to solve it this way. I always thought, you know, why, why, you know, like, why do I have to do it that way and not this way? And, and so I think it actually has been a recurring kind of interest of mine. Um, and so I say this because I just wanted to kind of, um, uh, 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 kind of raise that my initial kind of interest was actually about um, the problem solving aspect of it. And of course, for a study, I had to look for a problem. And the problem that I chose to study, um, apart, uh, again, in part due to my own uh, biography, I uh, grew up in Taiwan a little bit, New Zealand. Um, I seem to, uh, disasters seem to follow me uh, wherever I go. Um, I don't think it's my fault, uh, but that seems to be the case. But I chose to study earthquakes uh, and uh, particularly the problem of building earthquakes, which seems very uh, to be something that plagues many different um, uh, building cultures in, in the east, in the west, in the south, in the north, but also has remained quite a, uh, a persistent problem uh, throughout historical periods and even up to the contemporary. Um, and I think the, the, the initial entry point, you know, as with all these kind of um, uh, studies was a historical survey. Um, and the, the kind of the, the crux of it is that even though today the earthquake or any kind of uh, natural disasters is usually kind of uh, explained, articulated uh, in terms of its uh, technical constraints, right? It's usually like an engineering problem of some sort, you know, if we had more money, if we had more engineers, if we had more materials, this is something that we can solve. And 
And usually there is one, if not only a few limited number of correct solutions that you can do. I mean, you can think about an architectural practice, you design something, you give it to the engineer, they tell you whether this would work in the earthquake zone uh, or not, and then you make certain improvements. But it's not kind of, uh, at least uh, in the majority of uh, what we do, seen as a, um, a core problem. Um, but one does not have to look very far back into history to realize that actually there have been uh, very, very different interpretations of uh, natural disasters, of um, what it means, how to solve it. Um, and so beginning from the top, you know, it, basically most uh, literature point to um, a three-part kind of evolution. So uh, in, in kind of early history, it was really a supernatural uh, paradigm, right? So earthquakes are understood as these uh, supernatural phenomenon. And um, if it's supernatural, what you needed was divine intervention, right? So that kind of drove your, your efforts in a certain way. You know, instead of building more strongly, you prayed harder uh, in some cultures. You know, you might ward off some monsters. Um, occasionally, there are actually examples where um, what they thought they were doing to, um, you know, uh, pray to the gods actually worked uh, seismically. So in the Japanese kind of uh, buildings of having a very strong central pillar as, uh, uh, you know, has a certain symbolic uh, supernatural meaning that actually turned out to be quite a good uh, seismic strategy, but it's, it's really more by coincidence uh, than anything else. Um, and the key kind of shift uh, in the way that uh, I think our profession and the world more generally perceived natural disasters um, was around the uh, European scientific enlightenment. Um, and, and actually, quite curiously, the earthquake, and in particular, the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, was uh, many uh, scholars, not just in architecture, saw as a key um, catalyst in the European kind of a scientific enlightenment. And the reason for this, and this gets a little gossipy, so I'm sorry if it is, but um, basically the uh, Lisbon earthquake, which was a very, very uh, uh, damaging earthquake, happened on All Saints Day. So it's a very kind of holy day. It happened uh, early in the morning. Um, and so what happened was that the, um, a lot of the churchgoers, the congregations who were kind of you know, very piously uh, you know, in, in, the, in their congregation and chapel, uh, suffered really heavy kind of uh, you know, uh, tolls, death tolls. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the uh, rascals uh, who were kind of hanging out in the red light district of uh, Lisbon, uh, which was in a particular part of town, suffered very little, uh, very little kind of death toll. And so I think for many of the thinkers at that time, you know, who were um, uh, already beginning to debate this notion of providence, which is that, you know, all things in the world happen for a reason in this uh, very divine, very kind of a, a Christian uh, way. Um, they just found it difficult to understand how this could be the case, right? How, how can it be that the good Christians uh, suffered and that the, the others uh, did not? Um, and this led to uh, a more uh, uh, logical, uh, disinterested view of the world, and they actually began to do uh, what we can now uh, see as um, proto-scientific experiments, right? So they did these kind of naturalistic, more um, objective uh, depictions of what the disasters actually uh, look like, right? It's not no longer about what they thought it was about, but it was really about what they could observe with their own eyes. They also did some experiments. They did uh, structures to see if they were seismically resistant, and they did this by marching soldiers around the buildings to see, you know, really the, the precursor to the shaking table that we have today. Um, so that was the, the, the kind of the first major turn towards the uh, understanding of disasters as a natural phenomenon, natural in the sense of the natural sciences. And what that required, um, if you were to understand it that way, were scientific or engineering interventions, right? And I think to a large extent, that is still uh, very much the way that we understand disasters uh, uh, today. Um, the third kind of turn happened uh, in the later part of the 20th century, and this was a shift from a scientific to a social understanding of disasters. Um, and here, the key kind of insight is that the disasters itself is not the problem. It's really a, uh, it's something that kind of um, uh, reveals, manifests uh, latent social vulnerabilities that were already existent. And I think most of us, because this is the current paradigm that we live with, um, are very familiar with this, right? You know, the uh, disadvantaged, the vulnerable are disproportionately affected by disasters, whatever disasters uh, happen. And so if you were to understand it this way, then you begin to see a kind of recession of engineering or scientific solutions, even though they are still very important and you have to kind of get them right. But the important things become policy, right? You really need to address social issues with policy uh, interventions. Um, and so what I did, uh, or what uh, the portrait kind of began with, was a, um, uh, was a certain gaze at the problem. And I tried to, um, I mean, to try to um, put it very um, uh, simply, I tried to uh, think about 
how I might explain the problem of earth grade, right? If you were to explain to like um, the kindergarten, a primary school student, what is actually the problem of the earthquake? I mean, it's, it doesn't it affects buildings, but in many different ways. Um, and so I came up with six, uh, at least in my own imagination. Um, the problem with earthquakes is that it imposes additional loads on building structures, right? And that's why they might uh, be overloaded and fail. It's unpredictable in terms of uh, when it would happen, right? So it's it's very it's very scary because you don't you you cut, don't know how or when uh, to prepare for it. Um, earthquakes, uh, like a lot of the natural phenomena, resist precise modeling. So you can't you you kind of know it's going to happen. It happens. It has happened before, but it's quite hard to understand what actually happened, right? The, the, in terms of how the shaking happened, how that affects the soil, how that affects the building structure. Um, the fourth one was that uh, it cannot be seen, right? So it's this fear of something that you cannot see. And humans as kind of, um, you know, we've evolved essentially as very visual uh, uh, animals and it's uh, closely related to our cognitive kind of abilities to see is to know, right? So if you don't see something, it's actually really difficult to think about. Um, the fifth one was that uh, it's a problem because the probability is volatile. That's to say, you know, an earthquake would strike a city and you would know from historical precedent that maybe 20% of the, uh, the buildings would be damaged, but you don't know who is the 20%. And that's the, that's the issue. And it's volatile because um, your building is not going to be, or rarely are buildings 20% damaged, right? They're either like uh, completely destroyed or they are not destroyed, right? So this kind of volatility becomes very difficult to kind of manage. Um, and the fifth and last one is basically the fear of the unknown, right? So we don't know uh, what the earthquake uh, is going to do. Um, and that unknown is, is, is kind of the difficult thing to deal with in and of itself. And so in this kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, a chicken and egg kind of way, depending on what is your initial uh, kind of model of the problem, you know, how you framed it in the first place, it really determines uh, how you would solve it. Um, and some of these are, um, I mean, they're distinct uh, and they're different and in certain circumstances, even contradictory. So it really depends on how you think about it. So if you if you thought the problem was about uh, imposing loads, then your solution would be about lightness, right? You try to build the structure as light as possible so that the load becomes lighter. If it's about unpredictable time, it's about how do you maintain readiness over time so that you know you can be ready all the time and, and kind of get onto it. Um, a precise modeling has to do with how do you make uh, approximations that are workable but not perfect. Uh, cannot be seen has to do with, uh, it's basically a rendering problem. How do you visualize like a data sets? How do you visualize the real world um, with the inevitable kind of choice between what you see and what you don't see? And you know, uh, how do you kind of paint this picture, so to speak? Um, uh, multiplicity is more or less about the curation of diversity. So I think better known as diversification. It's what your stock manager would advise you to do with your investment portfolio. Um, and consistency is about the assurance of sameness uh, at all costs, right? So like uh, we're okay with paying a premium to assure the certainness of outcome, just to reassure whoever needs to be reassured that um, even if it's failure, then it's assured to be a failure. So, I mean, it's really the analogy um, if you have a parachute, um, uh, a parachute that you know has a hole in it is still more useful than one that you don't know whether it has a hole or not in it, right? Because you, you kind of need to know in order for you to make uh, certain plans about the future. Um, and so the book uh, from this kind of initial starting point uh, uh, um, examines its uh, uh, kind of traces it back to its um, uh, philosophical and historical basis, you know, how certain ways to, of thinking came about, where they emerged, uh, whether they emerged in different parts of the world, and afford to its architectural and urban outcomes. Um, and there are, I think, um, if I may call it that, uh, three uh, insights uh, from the book. The first is that it would be misguided for designers, architects, urban designers to think about disasters purely as technical problems. Um, and in fact, um, what is necessary is a combination of technical structural know-how with different kinds of social and cultural understandings. Um, and the reason for this is, is that the problem that we're dealing with is not a um, it's a wicked problem. Not to say it's evil, but it's um it's a very it's a technical term in the sense that uh, it resists um kind of um uh, clear formulation. Um, and I the reason I mean my this is my own kind of um a nerdy work. Uh, reason for that is that it's really a hybrid problem. So. Remember back to the kind of the paradigms of understanding disasters, right? Whether it's a divine kind of a supernatural phenomenon, a natural science one, or a social one. Um, one of the key debates in this in, in these kind of fields is whether the paradigms are 
supplanting each other, right? So in, when we shifted to the scientific paradigm, the people kind of forget and disqualify the divine understanding of disasters. And uh, likewise, when we shifted to a, a social understanding, when that emerged, did we kind of uh, get rid of the, the scientific understanding that can be forged? And I would say that in certain fields, that's certainly true, right? In certain kind of fields of engineering, if you had a advancement that, uh, you know, performed better than the one before, then it basically kind of wiped out what came before it. But the earthquakes, and I think many of the issues that we deal with in, uh, in the built environment are more hybrid. They become overlapped. Uh, they become like, um, uh, well, they, they become overlapped. You, you accumulate them as you, uh, as you kind of, um, as new models of understanding these problems of the world uh, emerges. Um, and you can see some of these examples in the world today, even in a very well organized Japan, right, uh, with their uh, escape strategies from central city, you still rely on uh, mythical creatures like the mythical catfish that you know, is supposed to cause the earthquake uh, under the uh, island of Japan. Um, and likewise, you know, a lot of uh, post disaster reconstruction efforts, which are, you know, engineering led, science led, um, are still uh, kind of uh, put together by religious figures. And so it's it's uh, the nature of the world uh, we live in today. And so therefore, we, it's often useful to go beyond simply um, uh, the understanding of disasters as a technical problem. Um, and the way that uh, the book tries to kind of um, uh, examine these design strategies is through cases. Um, and so over the course of the book, I think uh, there were around 120 cases from around 30 countries. And the goal was uh, in a way to demonstrate that designers have already uh, come up with very different options and strategies for dealing with natural disasters, right? So this is, we're not inventing this. This is already something that's been done, uh, it being applied in a world where it's simply kind of yet to be recognized as such. And these design strategies also vary very widely across you know, the entire spectrum of what we do in architecture, but also beyond it. So all the way from kind of furniture to buildings, of course, uh, rebuildings, renovations of buildings to larger urban plans, ecological kind of master plans. And in the way that uh, the way that we think affects the way we build, of course, accumulatively, it also affects the, how our cities are formed. Um, and one particular kind of um, um, uh, kind of uh, line of thinking here is how do you assign, how do you, how do you conceive of, and how do you distribute safety across a city? Right. Um, it's a classic problem for um, investment managers. It's basically what do you what do you uh, calibrate as your acceptable unit of loss, right? If you, uh, if you distribute one third of your income uh, into housing, one third into stock, one third into saving, are you okay with losing a third, right? That's basically implicitly what they're saying. And you would find that in, very, in different cultures, there are very different kind of um, tacit assumptions about what is the acceptable unit of loss. So all the way from kind of the left-hand side, you have a Los Angeles, which, is basically working with the market mechanism at a very individual level, right? So you can buy insurance for your property. Um, if that fails, then you know somebody can compensate you for it. But it more or less works at the uh, units of uh, individual ownership. And so you see, San Francisco has unfolded itself in a particular way because that's um, it's necessary to uh, have that kind of grain in order to um, manage the uh, risks that it's facing. You could also. Uh, observe a very different model in Tokyo, for example. So this is um, what is colloquially known as the Ankogawa configuration, the hard shell soft core. Um, and I always feel a little weird saying this, but basically the assumption is that they have these low rise, often kind of um, uh, quite frequently timber kind of neighborhoods on the interior of blocks. And on the outside of them, they have these larger buildings, which are concrete, you know, slightly more robust. Um, and the thinking is that if a fire was to break out, it would be contained with a certain block, right? So your kind of um, unit of loss would be one block. And that is a kind of safety uh, that people are okay with accepting. Um, and you, of course, also uh, have other examples on the other end of the spectrum. So this is Lisbon, uh, in particular, the uh, Baxia neighborhood, um, which is the most uh, kind of um, heavily damaged during the Lisbon earthquake, but also the most uh, kind of completely reconstructed. And there, because of the political regime at the time, it was really about the assurance of safety for all, right? So you see there is a, a kind of a imposed uh, and an extreme level of uniformity. So it uh, suppresses certain things in order to assure safety for for everybody who was there, because that was what was needed. Um, and another kind of, um, or the second kind of uh, benefit that came from, I think, taking a, a step back and to take this broader look as, uh, at design strategies as a whole, is that it was useful in revealing where the next 
a set of innovations was likely to come from, right? I mean, we can also get very caught up in the specificities of our problem at hand, but if you take a step back, then it uh, becomes clear uh, what the lower hanging fruits are. So if we think about diversification as a design strategy, then uh, one of the directions that seems very promising is to diversify beyond uh, architecture, basically, right? So you can rebuild a city, you can rebuild a settlement uh, in the best way possible, with the best intention possible, but uh, it's becoming kind of increasingly clear that uh, the uh, community also needs to have a sustainable business, social economic kind of model in order to sustain itself, right? So um, you are kind of diversifying beyond the built environment uh, into the business model for the community, uh, into kind of the uh, social, the maintenance of a social um, uh, social cohesion. So this is a reconstruction project uh, from Western China. And uh, it was uh, in a kind of agriculture, but also tourist kind of heavy uh, region. Um, and so the typical approach would have been to kind of build uh, low rise buildings across the settlement, right? So, I mean, what they went with was a slightly mid density arrangement in order to conserve the land that was around the settlement, which was very important for conserving their particular way of like agricultural or tourism. Um, and you see a little bit how um, the designers um, conceive of the reconstruction of the buildings as just a small part, maybe one third of the entire reconstruction strategy. And the other kind of um, direction of innovation in this particular strategy that we're talking about is to move towards uh, finer grains of safety, right? So, you know, we we're talking about before, what is your acceptable unit of loss? Is it a, a building? Is it a neighborhood? Is it a few rooms in your building? Um, and so arguably, the smaller you can go, the better, right? Because uh, if you lose a room in a building that could uh, still um, you know, cause uh, injury or death to its inhabitants. But if you lost, uh, let's say, uh, three pieces of furniture out of 10 in a particular room, then you start to uh, detach it from the scale of the human, right? So uh, this actually uh, has been one of the very interesting lines of inquiry in this particular strategy, which is to embed, to utilize a kind of a modern uh, a product uh, production, right? The production of furniture, to embed the safety that is necessary for, uh, for, for earthquakes. Um, and of course, it has very interesting implications in terms of uh, whether you can put these things into existing buildings, right? And so you get around the complexity of having to do a complete uh, rebuilding of uh, the existing building stock, even if they're not completely safe. So this is the earthquake table uh, designed by a Israeli firm for uh, schools. Um, and that one is the furniture house, is one of the early experiments uh, I should move on. Um, the second kind of uh, uh, insight is that what is uh, shareable uh, between kind of architects, designers, urban designers, it's not so much the repeated use of the same technical solutions um, in different parts of the world to solve uh, different, this, the same problem, but it's a, it's a sense of the design strategy or the, a sense of the design scheme. It's really about a certain way of seeing the world. And that's the reason why uh, I have kind of um, uh, chosen to organize the book in this particular way, really uh, almost as six parallel books, right? Each tracing back to what the historical kind of basis might be, and then forward to its, um, its built uh, uh, environmental outcomes. Um, and I mean, I, if I may take you through uh, one of these, um, like uh, looking back and then looking forward kind of exercises, here we're looking at some of the um, uh, non-architectural uh, pre-modern cases to do with uh, diversification. So this is a chapter on multiplicity. Right? It's about how do you, uh, it's, it's in a way a more sophisticated version of uh, don't put uh, all your eggs in my basket. <laughs> That's what it's about, right? So you can see um, this pursuit of safety in numbers as a very common evolutionary strategy in a lot of animals and organisms, right? The strolling fishes, small fishes get together so that they uh, are, um, you know, they may be more conspicuous, but individually they actually have a higher chance of uh, survival because they are better at detecting the enemy when they come uh, and potentially they can also ward the enemy off because they look very large and very scary, right? Um, and you can also see uh, a similarly kind of um, uh, 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 simple, um, uh, approach to diversification in the fable of the bundle of the stick. So uh, in case you're not familiar with it, um, it's basically the old man. He has very, he has three quarreling sons, right? And so in order to demonstrate their uh, uh, strength together and weakness apart, he you know, asks each of them to break an individual stick. And they know it's so, it's so thin, so they break it. And then he uh, gets a really large bundle of stick and he's saying, you know, now break this and none of them can kind of break it um, and to demonstrate that, you know, together they're, they're much stronger. And of course, the interesting thing, um, uh, which is a kind of the one step improvement from the showing fishes is that 
when you get the bundle stick and you try to break it, but you don't break it, none of the sticks are broken, right? That's really kind of the, that's really the, the, the improvement from the shoaling fishes. The shoaling fishes is that, you know, uh, every, every day, a certain percentage of your, of your fish friends are eaten, um, but pro uh, probability wise, um, you still have a better chance of survival. So already you see there's a subtle, but uh, actually quite a distinctive uh, improvement to how you could deal with probability and the chances of survival. Um, and the key kind of difference, uh, the key kind of jump, of course, came in the uh, during or right before the Renaissance with a shift from the understanding of um, uh, uncertain things as luck to uh, mathematic probability, right? So once they got the hang of probability and the understanding that actually these things are not governed by, you know, divine uh, beings or like what I did before and whether I was good or not, and but just by kind of a, a universal consistent uh, mathematical loss, then they really kind of got their head around it in terms of thinking about um, assigning their, um, uh, kind of distributing their resources, so to speak. Um, and actually, uh, you know, as with many things, uh, as with many um, of these stories about the emergence of these scientific uh, principles, there was also a period of um, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, hybridity, that's to say, um, the study of uh, probability, uh, a lot of it came out actually uh, with the study of gambling. There were like some very committed gamblers uh, in, in kind of that uh, history of Europe. Um, and they did not kind of, uh, they really approached the, uh, they got to where they got this kind of a more rational understanding of a probability, not through mathematics, but through fairness. They thought that everybody should have an equal chance of winning. <laughs> Um, and so, and they worked it out and, you know, their solution was correct, but the way they got there was not necessarily the right one. Um, and, you know, looking more uh, uh, to more recent examples, uh, not super recent, but you also have the story of the uh, three little pigs, right? Uh, to my mind, that's also a story about diversification. So um, the classic kind of story is that, you know, the first pig was a, a little bit lazy. The second one was uh, only interested in like superficially battering his uh, older sibling. And it was thanks to the um, kind of the, um, uh, the committed, hardworking uh, younger pig who built the brick house that they were all able to survive the wolf attack, right? But uh, in, in my kind of, um, or in the interpretation of this, you know, uh, with diversification as now the uh, primary goal, I would say that it's also good that they also didn't all build brick houses, right? Because brick houses, as we know, are very weak in earthquakes. Um, and in fact, it's good that the three siblings had different um, uh, uh, personalities. And, you know, some of them chose to build a hay house, which, um, you know, probably has very good insulation properties and very low carbon footprint. So if there was a tax credit, uh, they could take advantage of it. Uh, the timber house is probably going to be the one that is the best at uh, resisting the earthquake. So, you know, if they were doing it in that zone, that's good. And of course, they still need one uh, uh, brick house in case the wolf ever comes and you want something that's a little bit stronger. Um, and the most kind of recent uh, uh, episode in this evolution was the um, emergence of these uh, uh, mathematics model, mathematical models, uh, particularly in investment, right? How do you have the perfect investment portfolio? And there is actually, they have worked it out uh, in the, the University of Chicago School of, kind of Economics, um, uh, a mathematically perfect model of how do you have a, um, a investment portfolio that is able to uh, uh, make as much, as much money as you want, but with like a minimizing, well, minimizing the risk. Um, but the issue, of course, for us uh, working in architecture is that unlike the stock market, we have very particular scales that we have to work with, right? You, you cannot build uh, buildings to any size you want. You cannot kind of uh, build them, demolish them, move them uh, anytime that you want. Um, and so we're really, in a way, still dealing with the practical interpretation of something that uh, perhaps abstractly has been worked out very well. Um, and here, for example, we're looking at some of the building cases uh, organized roughly in a chronological way um, in the chapter on lightness. Um, and again, the, the, the one of the interesting, or well, interesting to me at least, um, uh, exercises that was done is to try to understand how the way we think really affects the way we build. Right, so I think it's it's something that's often cited in in a architecture school like this. You know, we shape our buildings and they in turn shape us. But what do we really mean by this? So in the pursuit of lightness, in particular, as engineering strategy, um, if you look at the historical cases, um, you can see them kind of mapped out here. There was a clear kind of pursuit of longer and bigger spans in the modern period. Right, you want a bit longer, uh, but the pursuit of length really kind of limited the ability to build high. 
right? And you can kind of understand this intuitively. If you're pursuing a lightweight structure, you can build quite long span things, but to stack them up because you have equal kind of weight and cumulatively, it's actually very difficult to build something much uh, taller than two or three floors. Um, and then in the contemporary period, uh, roughly kind of defined as the, the 2000s and after, so in the last kind of 20 years or so, um, you see a clear kind of emergence of two ways of approaching lightness. One was to build things with super thin elements, super thin glass, super thin steel. Um, and the other was to use uh, skeletonized uh, structures, right? You try to hollow things out while maintaining the overall kind of um, uh, depth of them. Um, and uh, by kind of putting them on a, uh, a graph that's uh, depicting the height and the uh, typical structural span uh, of the building, you see that uh, they have clear uh, overlaps, of course, right in the center. If you want to build something that's kind of a regular dimension, then you can go with both. But if you want to build tall, there's only one, one way of thinking about it. And if you want to build a much longer or much shorter, there's another way of thinking about it. So different design strategies, they overlap very often in what we do, but they do have clear kind of um, uh, areas of misoverlap too. Um, and so across these six chapters, each one of them uh, conducts this kind of exercise to uh, look backwards and then looking forward. Um, and I mean, and for the reason that a lot of these, um, uh, there is also a real world out there uh, beyond architecture and design, um, a lot of uh, thinking that kind of evolves, right, uh, in, in, in human society also happens out, uh, outside architecture. So it necessarily drew on a, a range of disciplines all the way from kind of art history, um, engineering, uh, finite model analysis, the history of science was particularly useful, uh, communication, um, uh, uh, mass communication, public health, um, kind of um, a lot of business uh, sorry, mathematics models from investment theory um, and also just from kind of evolutionary science, right? The, these, these problems are uh, kind of persistent, but who, which field becomes the cutting edge to think about it, it changes over time. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, close to or adjacent to architecture. Um, and you see that in each uh, of these chapters, each of these design strategies, they also are examined through the uh, build cases and they exhibit uh, clear uh, limitations, orientations. Some are very good for building tall, some are very good for building uh, kind of uh, long structures. Um, uh, some in the modern period were able to achieve great height, but in the contemporary period are more interested in other things. Uh, and so uh, we turn to much more normative kind of dimensions. Um, and the third um, and, the, and the last uh, insight uh, is that um, as kind of a, taking a step back, uh, you know, at the end of this particular uh, research uh, inquiry was that the ability to recognize different kinds of design innovations, I think, is going to be more important for navigating the new problems that we're likely to face uh, in kind of the next few decades, particularly without entry into the Anthropocene. That's uh, another way to say it is that the problems that are likely to be the most pressing, we roughly know where they might come from, but it's not yet well defined, right? So the question is, how do you prepare for something that's yet well defined? You know, how do you study for it? How do you build a program around it? Um, and so the kind of um, the the inevitable conclusion is that we uh, should uh, become uh, we are able to think more abstractly about how we would solve a problem um, and to kind of. Um, anticipate where uh, solutions are likely to come from. And I think more importantly, to be able to recognize the different solution, uh, different types of design innovations when and if they occur, right? You don't want to miss these kind of opportunities. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see here, the kind of the shapes and forms of these different ways of thinking about the earthquake overlap on the same graph. Um, they begin to show, um, or they begin to allow you to do um, interesting things with them, uh, interesting kind of insights. Uh, one particular way you can think about it is in terms of areas of overlap, right? So there is obviously this core area down the center, um, which is within the familiar range of building dimensions, you know, up to about three or four stories, ranging from about two to um, you know, 12, 15 meters uh, long spans, that basically you can design uh, any way you want. Uh, there are, um, uh, you can uh, have studied in the Beaux-Arts school, you can come from a very engineering background, you can decide to sketch first, you can um, you can approach it anyway, and you know you would come out with a, a design solution that is more or less workable. But as you move into the periphery of the building dimensions, much things that are taller, things that are uh, kind of longer, then you find the number of options uh, receding quite quickly. So if you want to build something that's kind of say taller than five floors um, and ranging and span uh, up to about um, sorry, let's say five to twelve floors uh, tall. 
then you find your options really reduced down to three. Um, and they, uh, they don't have to be the only way you think about your design project or the way you drive it in office, but it has to be one of them, right? Because they are inevitably offering you a particular way of thinking through how to structure the building um, when they become uh, slightly larger. And of course, when you get to um, much more extreme dimensions, at least uh, as defined today, you know, things that are perhaps uh, 24, 48, 100 stories, then you uh, find very quick convergences towards um, a familiar ways of thinking. So you design a tower, you're basically thinking about the structure uh, as at least one of the top three considerations of the design. Um, and working through it like this, uh, I think allows um, us to observe uh, to talk more abstractly, uh, to recognize certain patterns of how different design solutions overlap in a problem space. Um, and so if I can walk you through some of my uh, poorly phrased uh, 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 boundaries, um, at the bottom, you have a minimum habitable height, right? You don't have buildings that are shorter than one story because it's not habitable, right? Uh, and likewise, you have a minimum habitable span. You, uh, structural spans usually are two meters or more because you need to put at least a line, person lying down in it. So these two kind of sites are pretty clear um, why they would be like that. Um, and then it's quite interesting and um, uh, that once the, um, uh, the length of the structural span and the height of the building and floors is uh, a scaled in a algorithmic way. That's to say kind of receding in like the Richter scale. So, you know, three floors, six floors, 12 floors, up to hundred floors. So each one of these, the magnitude increase a little bit. It actually begins to exhibit the shape of a natural distribution curve. So uh, I think that's one of the interesting discoveries from this particular project, um, which also conforms to our intuitions, right? So you can build something that's very tall, but it would be difficult to build uh, at the same time, something that's very wide. And on the left-hand side of this, um, I would say that it's primarily a constraint of economics, right? Because if you have built something that's, uh, say, uh, 50 stories, uh, you, can be a, you can be pretty sure that you can build something shorter. Right? It may be more expensive. Um, and we understand this in architectural practice that, you know, if you move to a certain structural system, it would be economically better because of the constraints of code, because of the constraints of technology to build like tow floors, for example. And then if you put two elevators in, then you really need to move up to like 25 or 30 floors. So I think that also tests out with our um, personal experiences. And on the right-hand side, it's probably more about technical limits of height and span, right? That it's quite difficult yet, uh, at least uh, in the disciplines of architecture engineering to do things that are uh, a combination of being very tall and very long. Um, and I think, the general um, uh, uh, summary, if I may, is that there, it's pointing to a general shift away from a singular and perhaps more classical understanding of what is good, what is beautiful, what is good design, what is good architecture, towards a more uh, towards recognizing a broader range of capacities and talent. So here on the bottom in particular, in contrast to uh, the, the David, is um, elite athletes from different Olympic disciplines, right? So you see they come in all sizes and shapes. They're definitely all healthy, right? Because they're very elite sportsmen. Um, they're clearly better at some things uh, and less so at other things. Um, and I, uh, in my own kind of, um, uh, if I was to make a prediction, this is also uh, the kind of error in architecture and design that we're in, that it's, in, it's important to kind of recognize the differences, but not about a pure kind of celebration of it, but also the necessity to think precisely and kind of uh, uh, accurately about it, because, you know, ultimately we're in practice and we are tasked with uh, choosing one approach versus another uh, in a particular circumstance. Um, and just as the kind of um, final part to the book, is that um, there perhaps also would be useful uh, applications um, for adjacent problems. So you know, dealing the, the intersection with uh, the built environment, with the natural environment, flooding comes to mind as one of the other kind of uh, similar issues. Um, and a kind of um, a more uh, abstract understanding of how we solve problems like these perhaps would allow you to kind of navigate not only amongst the existing solutions, but perhaps also to begin to guess where uh, new solutions might come from, right? So you might have something that's kind of missing here. So this is where we might gaze a little bit and then you have an understanding of how the existing solutions inter, uh, uh, interrelate to each other, uh, if or if not, they may be able to overlap. Are we doing okay for time? Yeah, I think we have five minutes.
Yeah. Oh, okay. That's, that's really... Oh, this is also very extended. Yeah. Maybe 15. We started a little bit late. But yeah. yeah. I might, uh, if it's okay with you guys, I might go through this part a little bit quicker, but uh, I, I'm very glad I had the opportunity to unfold the, um, uh, the thoughts about the book uh, in more detail. Um, so the second uh, kind of, um, uh, or the last part of this, I just wanted to kind of um, uh, brainstorm, so to speak, some of the stuff that uh, I and my collaborators have been thinking about since the book was complete. Um, as with uh, any of these kind of uh, research projects, it's a, it's a slow burn uh, over many years. And we have uh, also, um, our thinking has also evolved uh, since. Um, so we also um, have a small practice on the side um, called Semester Studio um, with certain kind of uh, research thing, uh, building um, uh, ambitions. Um, and I think if I was trying to summarize what we are interested in, in thinking about, is, a, is to advocate for the value of well-designed spaces, even in our current kind of technologically driven uh, world. Um, and this uh, photo in particular, what's from one of our studies that we did in Rome um, with the support of some fellowships into how people, um, into the function of slowness uh, of cities, uh, basically. Um, and uh, we were able to take some of these insights into uh, one of the recent projects that we had uh, completed um, we were recently commissioned to do a, um, a pavilion at the China International China Furniture Fair. This uh, was in Shanghai. Um, and this really kind of um, allowed us to think about the issue of sustainability, uh, which is, I think, our next kind of a big interest after the uh, pursuit of resilience from risk. And so this is our, uh, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about whether that's a good uh, direction to run it. But basically, most of these uh, expos, they present a um, extreme condition in terms of uh, material consumption, right? They're built kind of in two or three days. They are exhibited for a, a week, perhaps. And then most of it uh, basically is, um, is, um, uh, is thrown out. Um, it's, it's for this kind of momentary um, uh, exhibition. And so we wanted to set for ourselves uh, what we thought in the beginning, a very simple challenge of how do we realize um, a, uh, our pavilion uh, this temporary structure uh, with zero waste. Um, and we were also very interested, and I hope you can see a little bit of the uh, carrying over of the thoughts from the uh, research project, but we were interested in the different types of recycling. Uh, and the type of recycling that we were particularly focused on was a, a reuse, 100% uh, reuse. So we didn't want to kind of give things away for free. We didn't want to um, put things that were decomposable to a landfill. We wanted the materials to come to us and then to be returned without damage so that they can be used for whatever they were being used before. So we be began with a, um, a, a survey of the furniture maker clients kind of a, a supply chain, their factories, to see that they were already uh, moving a lot of materials and office supplies between their Beijing and Shanghai campuses. Um, and so what we suggested was that we could tap into this existing material flow um, and to re-divert some of these materials that included kind of the timber um, in raw form, um, some of their office furniture, they were also doing some construction uh, site expanding their campus. So there were some construction materials, gravels, uh, trees that we could play with. Um, but they would be transported here to the Shanghai camp, uh, exhibition venue for a week, and we would hold them stored there, hence the, the, the name temporary storage garden. We would store it here temporarily um, before they are returned to wherever they need to be returned to. Um, and we, 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 we try to take um, kind of careful notes about how they were used um, in the factory setting. So uh, avoiding, I hope, uh, some of the um, uh, uh, conventions about how they're typically used as finishing materials, right? So the timbers are stacked because that's just the way they uh, work materially. And so we also stack the ash timber and we tied it uh, so that we didn't need any nails or screws to damage the timber. And so they could be, uh, actually they were also not cut. So they all come in these kind of roughly 2.8 meter length. And a lot of these kind of joints were, accommodate, were to accommodate the manufacturing differences, right? So we don't have to trim them all to the same length. The fabric also, um, they came in these large 100 meter long rolls. And so we also didn't want to cut the fabric before they were making furniture, right? Because you don't know what they actually needed. So we draped them without their intervention um, uh, in order to um, uh, uh, use them, but uh, not to damage it. Um, and likewise, the plants, which were uh, ultimately destined for uh, the new landscape around their uh, new campus, 
um, the plants and the trees from the nurseries, uh, we took kind of special care to, um, not ourselves, of course, but to instruct the gardeners to package the roots in a very careful way. And actually for the duration of the exhibition, they stayed inside their pots. And so the floor was kind of slightly raised. The gravel was also for the landscape, uh, destined for the landscape. Um, and so uh, we had a, a kind of a lady coming here to water the trees, water the plants over the duration. And I'm very happy to report that uh, the trees and the plants have uh, survived their, their ordeal uh, with us uh, for this week. Um, and over the kind of uh, last decade or so, the exhibition, this International Shanghai Furniture Fair has also emerged as an urban laboratory of sorts. I mean, it's a very, it's a, uh, I mean, by kind of international standards, uh, enormous kind of uh, exhibition venue. This uh, particular part that we were in is only one eighth of the overall thing. And it became like an urban laboratory, right? Because it's approximated streets, approximated uh, uh, um, uh, blocks. Um, and some of the uh, previous uh, designers uh, who had held this commission uh, Avaro Siza did it two years before, um, Marion Hu did it the year before us. Um, they also used it as an opportunity to kind of make their own a statement about what they thought was the like an interesting or uh, important relationship between the individual kind of um, building or pavilion with the broader, larger whole. Um, and so we uh, conceived of our particular uh, version of it as a, uh, as a public garden of sorts. Um, and we wanted to offer a place of rest, um, a place of kind of serendipitous uh, inter, inter, um, interventions between, uh, sorry, uh, intersections between people, um, in part because of the, um, the central location occupied on the main thoroughfare. Um, and it could be a meeting spot. And of course, uh, to be a meeting spot, uh, even if you're not directly um, conducting uh, the business, is, uh, is a very good thing in terms of kind of um, communicating the values of the client. Um, and here are some of the um, uh, more close up details. And so we really try to kind of um, uh, work with the, I think there's a, I think sustainability, like one of these, persistent design problems um, has its kind of, um, every generation of designers has their own interpretation, right? There were the historical kind of interpretations um, about how do you make things last forever, the pyramids, for example. There were the modernists who thought a uh, form follows function, you know, how do you build only the stuff that you need? Right? That was in a way their own uh, interpretation of how to address this issue. To more, I think, recent interpretations of, um, you know, measuring and focusing on the carbon footprint, the decomposability of materials, or whether they can be reused. Um, and I think the direction that we went with this, um, in part due to our own interest, but in part, I think, to expand the repertoire available uh, to our discipline, was to take the materials that were already existing and instead of trying to reshape it to a particular kind of design will, um, simply to kind of um, reorganize it to allow the inhabitants to see uh, the familiar and uh, to see the familiar anew um, and to kind of um, find beauty in something that they have already encountered before. Okay, I think I'm going to conclude my talk there, if that's okay. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yuen. Maybe we can I'll have maybe one or two questions and we can open it up to the audience. Um, but I really appreciate that 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 presentation was actually the first time that I have kind of gotten a really amazing synthesis of your work. I remember um, when I first asked you when we were, you know, overlapping at the GSD what your doctoral research dissertation was about, your answer for me was um, about wicked problems, right? <laughs> and then you proceeded to kind of define that for me in a, in, a, in a abstract and very interesting way. And then a few years later, I saw that you published this book about, you know, designing and thinking around seismic zones. And, I, and, and, and that was uh, kind of a delight to, to, to find, but also a surprise, right? Mm -hmm. But then the way you described it to me, I think it, it, it or the book today um, made a lot of sense because I, I find that particularly the value of your work uh, and, and the value of the book is, is in offering a way, a new way of, of thinking of things that, of, of problems, as, as what you're saying, uh, a new way of thinking of, of, a, of a familiar class of problems that we, we kind of re reframe in a new narrative, right? Um, and the idea of like tackling a wicked problem by using a particular wicked problem in this case, right, an earthquake, to kind of weave a narrative about how we should be actually thinking differently about approaching problem solving as a kind of societal, you know, 
goal and not just through design schema or not just through design technical problems, right? And I think what's fascinating to me is you set this up in a variety of dichotomies, right? Even in the way you present your, your, your work, right? So you start with this idea of like, the place versus the problem, right? The place as a kind of location specific and, and the value that that brings versus the problem as a more uh, kind of universal. You set up this kind of dichotomy of like thinking versus building and, and what are the values of, of, of taking ways of thinking to apply to ways of building and vice versa. You talk about um, the dichotomy between technical and, and social, right? Um, and that the need for the hybridity between. You talk about the idea of like defining problems versus uh, solutions that answers answers the problems that you defined right in a different way based on the way you defined it, and then you also set up your presentation in a way to talk about um, research and and practice actually in some ways right the application of research thinking in a in a new class of problems or another kind of class of problems. So I don't know that this is necessarily a question, and I have a couple ho hovering in mind. Um, one maybe, but one one, and you kind of touched on this at the very the very um, end of your first section um, is um, how would you suggest that we apply design thinking through the variety of other wicked problems, um, especially when it comes to like natural disasters and, and human settling in um, kind of very kind of um, uh, like uh, um, um, high risk areas. Um, Meaning that um, particularly in like areas of like coastal threats, um, which, you know, through post-colonialism, we have settled always along the coast or uh, in, in, in wildfire prone areas. Right. So so, you know, how can your method of thinking really start to engage in um, other wicked problems? Right. And you hinted at, at, at that generally, but I wonder if I don't know if this is too specific of a question, but I wonder mm. if there is your thoughts on, you know, broadening that. No, thank you for the uh, invitation and for the problem too. Um, I, I mean, now I, I've had a little bit of time, uh, the luxury of hindsight since, you know, maybe almost uh, a year or two since the actual writing part of this was complete. Um, it has been useful, to, especially in forums like these, to think a little bit about um, why, it was, why it was all useful, uh, if at all. Um, and I think the aspiration of the, um, I can imagine three types of readers who might find it useful in different ways. I mean, the first obviously is people who are working in earthquake regions, right? And then you can kind of see some other people who are working in this region. Then you see, you know, maybe previously in your context, there were not people building with um, stone. Um, and now you see, oh, actually you can build with stone, but you just need to do it in this particular way. And it might have certain limitations in terms of how tall or how, um, uh, why you can build, but it's possible, right, to offer the possibility of options. Um, the second kind of um, uh, way I think, I, I hope this book might be useful, I think it's closer to what you're saying, is that it offers a certain uh, direct transferability to adjacent problems. Um, so, uh, you know, other types of natural disasters usually arising from the problematic intersection between uh, buildings and the built environment which we like to be quite consistent, right? You know, you, you want to, when you leave your house in the morning, you more or less expect it to be where you left it <laughs> when you come home. Otherwise, how would you plan your day, right? Where would you park your car? And so, um, whereas natural systems obviously are not mm -hmm. predictable, mm -hmm. right? So uh, a lot, I think a lot of the issues that we're uh, confronting is about this. Um, and the third, uh, slightly more elusive way is, um, which I'm not sure if it's uh, particularly uh, true, is that it might help us think about how we think about design. Um, and I think that is maybe uh, one of the more interesting part, but also the, the part that I, I wish I had dig a little bit uh, further into. But if I can kind of reflect a little bit on your particular question about um, flooding, for example. I, uh, there, there is, I mean, the, the, the way that, uh, the focus on how we think about design, how we kind of plan our buildings, plan our cities, this kind of focus has kind of come in and out of fashion over history, right? Uh, you know, sometimes they're very interested in it. Sometimes they just kind of do what they do and it's kind of out of, you don't really think about it. Um, and my own kind of uh, reflections on it is that 
the way we think about design becomes particularly important when the problems become uh, unfamiliar, right? So, I mean, the problems we're dealing with usually are, are the same kind of um, type. It's uh, risk. Uh, how do you have resilience? How do you kind of uh, house a community of people together? That's the, the classic housing problem, right? How do you organize a community? How do you kind of um, live next to water, which has all these good things, but not get flooded? Um, but every time the problem becomes more complicated, it becomes larger in scale or requires um, a broader uh, or requires collaboration beyond the typical kind of stakeholders, then it becomes much more uh, important that you're able to articulate clearly what is it that you are doing and why that's of value? And I, my suspicion is that we're also at a similar time uh, now that if you were to look kind of, um, if you were to go back uh, maybe 20, 30 years and to look back 10 years from there, it's perhaps a little bit clear. I mean, hindsight is always clear, but it's perhaps a little clearer where like what would be useful to study, what would not be useful to study compared to now where perhaps it's less clear. Um, and, uh, but it is, I think um, generally, um, agreed that the problems that we deal with are probably going to be more complicated. Um, we're probably going to need more collaborators beyond designers and architects. Um, and so it just becomes more important that you're able to say, what is it that the architect, the designer brings, right? Mm -hmm. As you have to do in all collaborations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, you know, I want to ask, uh, I don't know if it's a provider question or one that you might have an answer to, but it seems as if, you know, not that, you're suggesting any solutions, right? But you're presenting the, uh, a toolkit or a manual or a pattern recognition as a tool for others to make uh, uh, informed decisions, right? And I wonder if you were to put yourself in the shoe of a decision maker, which you absolutely do in your project, your, your the, the project in the, in the second, right? There's all these theories of how we should be settling and living around dis disaster prone areas, right? There's theories ranging from we need to retreat from the coastline. I, I mean, me not being very familiar with earthquakes and, 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 and earthquakes being a particularly wicked problem because they, they affect regions, right? And it's, it's, you know, what are you gonna do? Like, you know, pull back from whenever the major global plates meet, you know, that's not necessarily a feasible solution, but in other, in other let's say more localized disaster conditions, right? There's a variety of theories that range from, we need to completely retreat from occupying or settling these areas all the way to we need to you know to the other end we need to completely retrofit. There's value in in what's there and the history that that has that that's held, right? And I wonder, um, not to put you on the spot, but if you were to become projective as a designer decision maker, taking your own book uh, and the learnings from it, where would you position yourself in that kind of spectrum of like, you know, response or or even um, projective? In the flooding Act. case in particular. Uh, or or even with regards to seismic zones or regions, right? And in this case, perhaps the answer is less that, you know, we, we can't live in, in seismic zones, but but there has been certain theories where I would maybe like, for example, I, my understanding is that like San Francisco or some of the Northern Californian um, cities, they don't have these frequency of daily occurrences of or, or monthly occurrences of, of earthquakes. But when that big one happens, there's no way there's we're going to be prepared for it, right? Because it's going to be of a built up of, a, of an order of magnitude, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's a question. I guess my question to you is: Is there a sort of kind of projective um, positionality that you you would take um, based off of your familiarizing familiarizing yourself with the the problem at hand in some sense, mm -hmm. right? It's a well, not to put I, you on the spot. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm very. Yeah. I, I think I have a way to dodge it in a very <laughs> intelligent way. But um, I think, luckily, the earthquake and actually most of the problems that we deal with in uh, in buildings and architecture are technically quite well resolved. I mean, compared to all the other possible technical problems, right? How do you send humans to Mars? How do you kind of, uh, you know, explore the uh, the depth of the sea? Um, earthquakes in particular, and I would say flooding and typhoons for that matter, um, they're, they're, they're quite well resolved. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, today, if you have the advice from like a, not a brilliant engineer, but like a regular, well-educated engineer, you can build on directly on top of a fault line. Mm -hmm. 
and you would be like quite certain that the people inside would be okay. I mean, the house would tip a little bit, right? But you would be okay. You'd be more or less certain that the people, the, the house, the, the life inside would be, would be uh, preserved. Um, and so it's, it's really more of an, I think, um, uh, uh, indictment to why um, there are these uh, death tolls still. Mm -hmm. If, if mm -hmm. the technical problem is mm -hmm. so, what's the, the, the risk appetite is-, is Yes, the risk appetite right? and whether it's articulated or not, how it's actually distributed. Um, and in a way, uh, it does kind of empower, I think, our profession um, to, um, uh, to be, uh, to action because it um, reframes it less from a technical problem to become a design problem, right? How do you kind of bring different parties together, align interests so that the, um, the a, a desirable, if not a acceptable outcome uh, is reached. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I am able to advocate for, you know, total retreat or total uh, moving forward, but I, I would say that um, perhaps some of these um, uh, uh, tensions are, not uh, necessary. Right. There, I mean, I, I think one of the um, uh, the earthquake, for example. I mean, uh, I, for those, I'm sure many of us have encountered this in structure class. The classic model that I was taught was that you either build very lightly, right, things that are very flexible, like bamboo, or you build very heavily, and uh, that was detention, right. And so you, it was one or the other. But I think a closer look at it reveals that it's really not so much about this tension, um, but there are very different uh, approaches to it and uh, often overlapping, right? So you can readjust your expectations. You can uh, have a highly evolved insurance market, which is actually what San Francisco does. Um, and there are other ways to solve the problem uh, and they can overlap, they can intersect. Um, so that's, uh, I hope, a, a good way to sidestep your, your Unanswerable your question. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I guess I can just, for time's sake, I'd like to open it up to the audience if there are any questions. Um, Yeah. If you don't mind, I'm just like curious when you talk about natural disaster, earthquake and other things, but, uh, you know, if you look at like history of uh, human uh, settlements, like like natural disasters sometimes like change everything. Sometimes like mass rule, people like abandon their settlement moving on to different places, right? Mm -hmm. Or like some settlements are entirely gone because, because of earthquake, river direction change, so there was no water, they just mm -hmm. move out. Yes. Now we have a technology, so like we try to solve the problems. Mm. Um, but when you talk about natural disaster, but like there are different kinds of disasters, right? Earthquake is like kind of unpredictable, like, like volcanic eruptions. But now we have a flooding or like wildfires or like, you know, water level going up is like kind of predictable in macroscopic level and microscopic level it's unpredictable yes that's right and then if you're right like probably another book about another natural disaster <laughs> i don't think i can uh, something like a very predictable yes. right? how would you do this because like when you talk about unpredictable it makes sense you show the spectrum hmm. but like somehow like there is a kind of feeling of like you know, chasing a goose, almost like, you know, we're going behind. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there, there are two um, thoughts that come to mind. Um, first is that um, it, precisely what you're talking about, uh, of what is a disaster? And if you can predict or anticipate to some extent the disaster, is it still, you know, whose fault it is, right? Um, and actually that was the, uh, um, the key kind of turn in the um, in the most current understanding of disasters, right? So we had this uh, supernatural understanding, we had the scientific understanding. The scientific understanding was basically, uh, you know, it's 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 natural, right? The who who can who can stop this? But the social understanding, which is particularly kind of powerful, is that uh, it recognized that the disaster always affected uh, people who were vulnerable, um, and that to a, to a large extent, we already knew. Uh, uh, what kind of disasters were uh, going to happen and who was going to be affected, right? So if, if you knew, then is it still nobody's fault, right? Was basically the question. So I think what you're saying there um, is, um, uh, the, the differentiation between disasters, I think is already um, a problem that uh, luckily some other people are dealing with. <laughs> um, but I think you're, you're, you're um, raising a point about what might be 
the uh, like a slower burning problem that uh, one might look at. Uh, so, I mean, my own particular interest has recently gravitated towards um, uh, different types of different imaginations of uh, forever. Yeah. So I'm uh, currently working on the uh, like a, I mean, for my own kind of interest in a little working paper called uh, "Different Forevers: uh, Competing Known Overlapping Ideals of the uh, Perpetual." Right, and it, it arises out, I think, uh, both from the experience of working on something like this, but also in practice, which is that um, certain keywords like sustainability has become such a buzzword that it can mean almost anything, right? It can be social, economic, structural, whatever, material. Um, but the problem, uh, at least in my own diagnosis, arises when people are using the same word to say different things. Um, and so even though there is the uh, facade of a conversation, everybody sharing the vocabulary, actually they're talking about entirely different things. And so you do not have a um, kind of a, a, a resolution in the end because they're, they're not the same thing. Um, so what I think uh, I would be very interested to do is to take apart uh, this a little bit. And I mean, the, the pursuit of something that's kind of consistent and perpetual is uh, one of these things that drive humans, right? And so, and likewise, it drives a lot of architecture and a lot of design, uh, both in history and even now. But to take it apart and to see what are the different imaginations of these, right? And again, uh, if I can uh, do my uh, trick again uh, to reach out beyond architecture to look at, um, you know, finance managers, you know, when, when a client asks them to perpetuate their wealth forever, what does that mean? Uh, to look at uh, like uh, fables and stories, like, uh, you know, people wishing for forever life, but they got it in the story, but uh, it did not turn out the way they thought it was going to turn out because, you know, they grew old, their loved ones died, and, you know, they were not uh, happy with forever life that they thought where they were going to be. You know, what does that mean in architecture? I would, uh, I haven't thought about it as precisely as, as that, but I, my suspicion is that there are equivalents in architecture that, you know, they were at one time the epitome, the ideal of uh, something lasting forever, but they have not like worked out how they thought it would work out. So that is my um, my my current pet project, and uh, hopefully to yeah. uh, to grow uh, soon. <laughs> That's such a bit. Oh yeah, go ahead, Chair. No, no. Oh no, I was just going to respond to Hyunte, and again, this is I, I don't want to reveal my um, non knowledge about this or my naivety about it, but it seems to me that, um, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this unit. Um, that um, there may be a relationship between the predictability of a, of a natural disaster and the way it has manifested itself in the building codes that have been required mm. to respond to that, right? And in the case of an earthquake, um, because we have seen the effects of them for so long, that has really manifested itself, man, manifest itself in, you know, in a range of scales and, and cultural conditions, but in very well-defined rules, right? As the architecture design center that you have to follow. The follow. And that we are in a kind of current paradigm or a current reactionary moment in which um, architecture and the codes and the policies um, that need to absorb or react to levels of predictability in in um, in uh, natural disasters, um, you know, there's that kind of like playing catch up sometimes, and you know, I can I can you know, knowing that like for example, wildfires, right? There's now being introduced um, new ways of like building defensible areas, right? But it hasn't really perme permeated in mm. the toolkit of the designer uh, as much as it has permeated into academia, right? Structures and earthquake are one in one, right? Mm. And, and blow it, right? Um, and, and, then I, and, and then I find that even the idea of like coastal resiliency, it's starting to permeate a little bit into more progressive cities in their zoning codes, right? The idea of building for coastal adaptation, but again, you know, I, I just wonder if you have thoughts on this relationship between the predictability and the history or the length of history of these natural disasters and the way we build and design and, and, and you think about them, right, in a, in a kind of, um, you know, the solutions for dealing with them, right, have, have varied based off of the, I guess, the scale or the history or the, the you know, the length of these of our relation of our social relationships with 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 disasters. Yeah. Yeah. Not well, that there's a question no, no, or no. answer there, but it's no. just a comment. Well, yeah. I'm sorry that I'm going to again uh, use a metaphor to uh, explain a metaphor. Um, but essentially, um, the implementation of the solutions always follow our understanding of the problem, right? That's that's just the, the way it is, because if you, uh, so we might have a new understanding of flooding, 
um, and then we solve it. You can't solve it before you understood it, right? So uh, I think this lag is inevitable. But this other lag that you're talking about, which is the scaling of solutions that seem to work, right? To rely on certain rules, mm. which mm. requires you to kind of um, abstract something that has already worked. Mm. I think that is uh, mm. a, a specific problem uh, in and of itself, which is that how do you codify something uh, so that the, uh, the, um, the derivatives of it are uh, as good as the original, mm. or, or at least not uh, super bad? Um, and it's a very interesting kind of uh, a problem in and of itself. And I, 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 this is where the metaphor to explain the metaphor comes from. I'm sorry about this, but um, there is a very interesting kind of uh, literature about the quality of hieroglyphics uh, in, in Egyptian studies. Um, and the insight or the question was whether the first early hieroglyphics are of a higher artistic quality than the later ones. Once, you know, there, there's a lot more people, there's like professional school training people to do hieroglyphics and there's like a lot of craftsmen. Um, and the typical kind of um, uh, understanding is that, of course, the later ones are better, right? Because it's more developed. There's like a school doing this. There's like thousands of craftsmen doing this versus just like the initial, like a few artists who are kind of inventing this stuff. But what they found uh, is that the original stuff is better. Um, and uh, I think if you think about it uh, slightly, it probably would make sense because you would need to be kind of, um, uh, uh, I mean, they would be quite talented artists, right? To be the people who are tasked with uh, coming off the hieroglyphics. And it's the first case so they're, you know, putting much more efforts into it. They're not constrained only by kind of, there's no rules yet to constrain them, but they're kind of more focused on the problem and they would kind of go beyond, uh, over and beyond to kind of, uh, you know, do something that they thought was great versus something that's perhaps a little bit more codified. And, you know, the the, the, the followers who are um, you know, satisfying a certain regulation, but perhaps does not have the same uh, clarity of what the original intention. So I think that's, that's a scalability issue of um, you know, uh, New York uh, probably as one of the uh, forefronts of uh, you know, waterfront uh, flooding kind of interventions. Um, I'm sure it's going to work out well because there's very smart people who are thinking about this problem. Um, but you know, how do you uh, how do you share this local right. experience in a global world? Right, that that would be the more difficult problem. Right, or what, what's lost when it becomes codified, mm. and what's gained when you localize, or you know that that kind of tension, as you as mm. you say, and and the the maybe your argument, which is to 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 sidestep the tension. Right, the point is not to is to embrace it in some sense, mm. perhaps. But yes, Johan. So thank you for sharing your, work and your research with us and with me because the, there was a, a question that I had before, but your your uh, reference to the fact that you read it that makes me open out of things in my, my mind. But anyway, the question was how has your profession changed after the book because of the book and how is the book as your profession has helped your book in being built mm. so the connection and the kind of the merging of the two aspects of being a designer. Mm. And about perpetuity, is not the real perpetuity the capability of uh, our species to transform instead and stay what they are? I mean, in the past, perpetuity was, was considered as something that's forever, built mm. forever. Yes. Your church mm. stays as it mm. is, where it is, forever. Yes, that's right. Now, the thing is, something that is perhaps where it is, but certainly not as it is. Right. And that's the real forever, the, mm. the possibility for that piece of uh, architecture, that space to change, perform, adapt, and become something different. That because somebody would love the building forever, regardless of the, yeah, that, that's, that's right. That's the real forever yeah. that has. Yeah. It's like if, uh, among humans is the believing that there is another dimension when people live forever, or is believing that there is those people are living forever to you and to yes. your way of thinking about those people. Mm. Yes. So that's, that's, that was the more interesting question, but, but perhaps the first one that we want to address. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm happy to uh, reflect on both, but yeah, I mean, I, I have my own like uh, intuitions about what uh, what qualities of uh, like a uh, forever is more valuable to me from like a poetic sense or from a human sense, but um, but it would be different for different people, I'm, I'm sure. Like, uh, and so I think a um, kind of just laying out the uh, possibilities would, would be quite an interesting exercise. Um, but, I mean, certainly this idea of, um, uh, you know, maintaining a certain intensity of use versus a specific look. Um, I mean, the more abstract you kind of get, right, in terms of what you define as the thing that you want to maintain, in the way the easier the easier it becomes. Um, I mean, if you're talking about a certain income it generates, then you don't actually need the building anymore, right? Um, and 
but uh, is it still uh, meaningful, right? So I think there, that's actually the push and pull, right? Uh, how, uh, how important are certain specific things? Um, but in, in terms of the first question, I, you know, I, I think like a lot of young uh, practitioners and um, uh, teachers, we're always trying to balance our, um, the practice side of things, you know, like in the world, uh, off the world, um, and the thinking side of things, the, the um, you know, the freedom, the kind of latitude given in a, a academic a academy like this to think about the issues that perhaps would not be so easily explored. Um, I, I have found it uh, not so useful for myself to like a belabor a, a link between the two, like mm -hmm. at least at least not uh, not for now. Um, I mean, certainly there are resonances, and I I, I'm, I have my own thoughts about it, and perhaps uh, they have or have not come through in the work that we do. But I I think there is a certain difference, perhaps, in our generation of uh, designers versus uh, the ones that have come before us, is that um, uh, it has to do with the less clear trajectory of where the discipline is going. And so in a way, that has shaped our research and our practice um, uh, they have shaped both of it. And in a way it has pushed it apart. I think the practice side, at least for me, and I think some of my peers, is beginning to, uh, I think, lean towards something more like anthropology. Like we're really trying to understand and embed ourselves in a existing context of practice. And often, at least for us, we're working like uh, hyper-locally in a way, right? We're not kind of, um, um, you know, part of a, a larger, um, firm and kind of doing uh, large uh, projects uh, as direct commissions, but we're taking on what is almost like the most local project that even the local architects thought is perhaps not uh, like a, their bread and butter. Um, and that uh, I think of course affords us a bottom up view of how practice is actually sh like a shaped uh, in the local context. Um, and that uh, it, it sh uh, helps to inform and I think tease out the nuances of our research. So the research I think has also moved away from like, a, you know, big hero topics, right? Of like, this is my manifesto piece and, and drawing from like, you know, the deep wells of history, this one singular lineage into like a spear and the spear would take us kind of, you know, like far into the future. I think it's also become slightly more, uh, I don't know what the equivalent weapon would be, but you know, like something more diffused. Um, but uh, a tree, perhaps, you know, it's, it has a broader root, um, and the root has to be de as deep as the stuff that you want to grow above. Um, and um, I am uh, optimistic that something useful would come of it, but I, I don't think at this particular stage is yet um, important uh, or particularly useful to try to like force this uh, uh, connection. I have a like, comment. Um, it's something else, kind of like half joke to. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your work, and then I never thought like it just uh, Earth Trade would have this kind of like variety of spectrums. So I can see now, like if someone designs, you can see different like you know issues, and then some kind of like you know give guidance as well. Mm. On the other hand, like as a historian, when you see like it at a global perspective, like your level, right? Mm. And then like California is an example, they will have more and more wildfires. There's mm. a couple of like years there, like it will intensify. A couple of years later, they will have doubled, right? Mm. They have a drought. Mm. Drought is actually like continuous drought will actually reinforce wildfire too. Mm. And then they might have an earthquake, right? Mm. So you can design based on like assuming these natural disasters would happen at a certain moment in your life, right? Mm. So you can design architecture again and again. You can respond to situations continuously. Mm. But there should be a limit too. You can't continuously you know, try to solve the problem. At a certain moment, you mm. just got to get out of there. Right, that's just what I was kind of hinting you at my original. Bigger yeah. problems too, sure. as a yeah. species. Sure. Yeah, How can absolutely. you handle the situation? Yeah. So, one side totally makes sense. Like, it's like it's almost like practical in, like in thinking. Mm. But also like, uh, I don't know, urgency of the, you know. Yeah, or, or at what level is your your appetite for risk yeah. not financially, economically, socially, culturally worth the value of, of a locality of a place or the history of that place? Just because we've settled along the coast in a major multiple risk area, does that 
at what point does that not um, suffice as a justification to to live there in some in some case? Not that that's a, mm. it's just a comment of, of yeah, because of your, we your, are like comment. you know America is a rich country, but like last year I heard like more than forty million people in Africa mm. were displaced because of natural disaster, like you know just the the drought that they couldn't like raise the crops anymore. Mm. So mass like like migration to different countries. So you are like, oh, this is happening everywhere. So like, we can really like respond to situation to a certain degree. I don't think this is the moment, but mm. probably sooner or later, when you talk about natural disaster, we can't think it's unpredictable anymore. Probably it's predictable. Earthquake is different. That's why yes, I thought yes. earthquake is, oh, that's a very clever subject. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I was very, um, I mean, it, it was a deliberate choice to frame the earthquake. It, I think it has a certain randomness to it that was yeah. actually very useful for thinking about this particular problem. I mean, there are also, as you said, these slow burn problems, right, that are actually very predictable across the long term. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I'm not the person to make yeah. the judgments a uh, call about when to move out, but mm. Um, but if you, I mean, you would know this much better than I as a, as a properly trained historian, but my sense is that when people know, they know, right? When they know you have to move out of somewhere, it's, yeah. I mean, it's not overnight, obviously, but over like a few decades, then it's going to happen. Um, but uh, cities also have their resilience. Uh, if you think about an example like um, uh, Pompeii, right? So, you know, it had the, yeah. the two uh, volcanoes and it's not great. Um, they still had a like a nearby settlement nearby, even after Pompeii was like a entirely thrown, uh, kind of washed over. So um, there are kind of, uh, I think the consistency and resilience of cities are sometimes underestimated. Mm -hmm. And there are many kind of factors, you know, in the geography is destiny kind of way, many factors why cities uh, are what they are and where they are. And um, I mean, these things change. Um, some of the natural changes are perhaps more significant than yeah. they have been in the past, but um, I, I would say that some cities might uh, uh, move or evolve in drastic ways, but for others, it's probably more of an incremental change in the way that the, yeah. the, the natural forces are also uh, fast, but still incremental. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much, Yuri. Yeah, really you. enjoyed your talk. Thank you for sharing your work. Thank you. Thank you for joining us all.